Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Kathleen Stock. She is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sussex in the UK. She has published on aesthetics, fiction, imagination and sexual objectification. She is currently the Vice President of the British Society of Aesthetics. In her monograph, Only Imagine Fiction, Interpretation and Imagination, she examines the nature of fictional content. So, Dr. Stock, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, great. So, let's start by talking a little bit about the philosophy of fiction, because I guess that this is not a very mainstream topic in philosophy. Is that correct? Or... Um, I don't know that that is correct, uh, because I think fiction plays a role in a number of different areas in philosophy. What is true is that I think the people working in these different areas or working on fiction from different philosophical perspectives aren't particularly good at talking to each other or reading each other even. So um, obviously fiction is important in philosophy of art and aesthetics insofar as it's relevant to the study of literature. But in the philosophy of mind, um, fiction is important. Well, I suppose philosophy of mind and epistemology, people are interested in thought experiments. Mm -hmm. And then in the philosophy of language, people are very interested in what kind of, um, what kind of utterance is a fictive utterance or a, a fictional statement um, and how, what are the principles we use to interpret fictional statements and are they the same or different to the principles we use to interpret other kinds of utterances. So actually, I think it is quite a important topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, well, I was certainly not saying that it was not important. Just no, 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 I mean, considered important even. I mean, that's not always the same thing anyway, mm -hmm. but um, it's both important and I think considered to be important. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, then, uh, I mean, there are topics in common with other areas of philosophy, like you were saying, uh, for example, aesthetics and philosophy of mind and those sorts of things, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the most uh, important questions that you and other people explore in the philosophy of fiction? I mean, uh, are you trying to understand um, how people create fiction or what are the sorts of aspects of human psychology, for example, that people uh, like to explore while they're creating fiction or what exactly? No, no. Um, I mean, well, people might be doing that, but that's not what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I might bring information about psych human psychology into my arguments, but mainly in the book I wrote, I'm trying to do several things really. One of those things is to provide a theory of fictional interpretation. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what, is the, what are the processes, principles um, that we use to um, decipher what a fictional text means? Um, so that's a big question. Uh, and then I'm also interested in what is a fiction, mm -hmm. because that's a separate question so that's really more about I guess about ontology mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also interested in the relationship between the imagination and fiction because mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that fictions call upon our imaginations to do lots of work as readers and as viewers um, and it also seems to me that the author of a fiction is using her imagination when she creates a fiction so um, there's a, a close relationship between the imagination and fictions. And then it's, it seems to me that fiction, if, if we want to learn something about the imagination, we do well to look at the ways in which we interact with fiction because it just looks like such a paradigmatic case of the use of the imagination. So those are the sort of, broadly speaking, the three areas I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in questions that um, fall out of that, those, those areas, for instance, it seems that sometimes fictions ask us to imagine things that we can't imagine or that we don't want to imagine. 
or in some way we have difficulty imagining um like that you get impossible fictions but you also get fictions that describe sort of states of affairs that seem unimaginable in some way maybe they are describing a situation in a way that's morally rep you consider to be morally reprehensible and you just can't get on board with it imaginatively for instance so assuming that there are those cases i try and provide an explanation of what what's going on in those cases under the heading of imaginative resistance which is a big topic in uh, philosophy of art just to make this point clear when you talk about fiction are you only referring to, for example, literature and other pieces of art? Or are you also referring to uh, fictions that people might create, uh, for example, in a social context? I I'm not sure if I'm being clear here or not. But. Um, no, you are, yes. Um, well, my particular view of fictional interpretation that I defend in, in my book I apply it only to spoken and written fiction, so fictions that use words, that primarily use words. But that, so, yes, it covers fictional texts, novels, stories, um, but it also covers jokes, um, social fictions, you know, fictions that you just might make up on the fly, stories you tell your child, so, it, but as long as they words are involved, um, then that my theory is supposed to cover those. What my theory doesn't cover is um, visual fictions created by more than one person, as nearly all films are. So, fiction films, and it doesn't cover paintings or or sketches. I think there is a sense in which they are fictions, but I think you need a different story of how you interpret those fictions. You can't use the same story as you might use for fictions made up of words. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked you that question because uh, later in the interview, I would like to connect this topic with the one of gender. Uh, and there's this issue about uh, how people are talking about transgenderism today in our Western society, let's say. Uh, and I was just wondering if uh, there would be certain aspects of culture, of politics, and even other aspects of how people interact in society that you would classify under the rubric of fiction. Or not. Yes, I mean, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I've got, recently I've been doing quite a lot of public writing on sex and gender and on transgender um, ideology or trans activism, I would call it, because um, it's a sort of subset of views that I have in mind rather than any views at all that have anything to do with trans people. It's, it's just a certain kind of view of what a trans person is and the kind of legal and political entitlements mm -hmm. that they should have. I've been writing about that and I do think the concept of fiction is highly relevant there and doesn't get discussed and should do. So yeah, mm -hmm. it is relevant. Mm -hmm. You can go uh, on. <laughs> sorry, it is, it is relevant, relevant, but exactly in what ways? Well, I, I mean, I think that the idea that human beings can change sex is a fiction. There's nothing wrong with social fictions in certain contexts, right? We use them all the time, right? We, um, they might help us get along with people. They might help us, like, avoid talking about uncomfortable truths. Um, so generally speaking, you know, if somebody's really ill, you might tell them that they're looking marvellous. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, uh, that's just one example. Um, so we have a capacity as human beings to use fictions socially to um, help situations go more smoothly. And I don't think it's lying, you know, I think I would draw a distinction between pretending something and lying. I could, quite often when you pretend something, it's kind of understood that you're pretending. It's understood by the hearer even that you're pretending, but the, but the hearer pretends that you're not pretending. So there's a there's a sort of 
embedded structure of fi social fictions quite often. I pretend this and you pretend that I'm not pretending and, you know, we don't, we have managed to avoid talking about this uncomfortable thing. Now, um, between individuals, it might be very useful to be able to pretend that somebody can change sex or has changed sex if they suffer from severe gender dysphoria. Um, you know, it might be therapeutically good for them to pretend that they are of a different sex and they might pretend that you're not pretending and that works fine. What, in my view, what is going wrong um, is that the um, institutions, legal and social policy makers, uh, sorry, start, uh, institutions, lawmakers, policy makers, are now starting, in Britain anyway, to make pretending mandatory, <laughs> or at least to try to. Um, they say they want to institutionalize pretense um, about whether or not someone can change sex or whether or not particular people have changed sex. And I think as soon as it becomes an institutional matter, that raises all sorts of grave difficulties. For a start, um, once it becomes mandatory to pretend, it also becomes mandatory to avoid referring to the fact that you're pretending. So, mm -hmm. because once you say, this is a fiction, then you've basically exposed the fact it's a fiction. Um, and that can undermine um, the imaginative engagement, as it were, with the, the thing that you're supposed to be pretending. So, um, just as like actors on stage wouldn't turn around and say, hey, I'm an actor in the middle of a play, that would ruin the the kind of imaginative act and the um, the the sense of engagement. Equally, um, it can be disruptive to refer to the fact that something is a, so a social fiction. Mm. But <laughs> if we don't, if we lose the capacity to be able to refer to that institutionally, then effectively, very quickly. Um, we'll get to a point where lots of people believe the fiction but don't know why it's true. Because, so, just take a really simple example. If I'm pretending that this male person is a woman for social reasons and my children are watching me do so, they might not know I'm pretending. They might think, I believe it. Mm -hmm. And then they might come to believe it too because I have... I have not explained to them that this is just a fiction. Um, you know, so, so pretense can get quite out of control quite fast and turn into dogmatic sort of faith-like belief if we are inhibited institutionally from, in certain contexts, referring to the fact it's a fiction. And what governments now want to do, you, some governments, UK government apparently, certainly the Labour Party, if they get in, um, is inhibit our ability to refer to the fact that it is a fiction that people can change sex. So I am fine with individual acts of pretense in this area. I think I, I would, I'm, you know, I'm fine with that. I think it can be therapeutically useful, but we have to retain our capacity to be able to say this is fiction, not fact. Because of the effect on women's rights, because of the effect on children, you know, I haven't, I haven't yet said or explained what the downsides are there but I think I've written about it extensively I think there are downsides to um mm -hmm. to this yeah uh, we will get into the downsides but just before we get into that uh, so your position is not that you are against people changing their bodies in any way shape of or form it's just that you are against people uh, uh, trying to to deal with this sort of real of thing as if it was uh, real and not a fiction is that I'm not even against, uh, yes i'm against adults who know what they're doing modif sorry i'm not against adults okay who know what they're doing i mean even if they don't know what they're doing how can we stop them they're adults as long as they're consenting and um in, have the normal kind of capacities I'm not against people changing their bodies. I kind of wish we lived in a world in which they didn't feel they had to, of course. But I feel that way about cosmetic surgery. Um, and 
I'm, a, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not for banning cosmetic surgery either. So that's all fine. And I'm not against, you know, individuals deciding for themselves that they are very happy to use pronouns, use preferred pronouns to refer to this person, whoever it is, as the sex they would wish to be referred to as. That's all fine. And I do it. And I'm happy to do it. But we are losing our capacity to be able to ever refer to the fact that this is a fiction because it is being penalized. Um, you know, the, there's been some cases in Britain recently where the police have got involved about misgendering. <laughs> you know, that's, that's crazy, that's wrong. Um, and that it's illiberal and also it has harmful effects once we lose track of the idea that this is a fiction. It's not, people can't literally change sex. You can have, you can start to look like a member of the other sex sometimes if you're lucky <laughs> but um but you can't literally do it and I, i'm afraid we have to be able to say that in some contexts particularly when it comes to discussions about women's rights women's spaces women's resources and children mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure if that's the case in the uk but uh, are they pushing for policies that are written on the basis of um, I, I mean, uh, of uh, gender being a social construct and things like uh, self-identification or gender self uh, something. I, I mean, because here in Portugal last year, they pushed for a policy that was about that, about uh, people being able to determine, let's yeah. say, their, their own gender. I, I mean, is, is that the case? And if so, uh, do you think that's, that, that's also problematic or not? Yes, uh, so it's, it's precisely the case. Um, there has been a, uh, last year there was a public consultation about changing the law to make um, a legal sex change which is a fiction, as I keep pointing out, um, to make access to illegal sex change uh, a matter of self-identification. So to remove the medical uh, gatekeeping and to remove the period in which you had to live as, a, live as if a member of the opposite sex for two years. So they want um, trans activists, big organizations like Stonewall want to remove those conditions and make it just a matter of filling in a form and paying some money and you can change your sex legally. Um, yes, I'm against that uh, because I think the society, the structure of society we live in, I mean, I'm a feminist, so I believe um, that there are significant disadvantages for females in, a, in this society that persist um, and in recognition of those uh, disadvantages or inequalities, we've developed over time certain social structures and protections for females. Like, very basically, we have separate changing rooms for females and males on the assumption that it would be bad for females and possibly bad for males if we just indiscriminately mixed everybody up while they were getting undressed. We have separate dormitories in hostels for males and females, I mean, I think this stuff's pretty obvious. I think it's pretty obvious why we have those things. And self-ID, um, when combined with a rather confused equalities law, which is also the case in Britain, practically means that institutions are now saying that self-identified males, even without a legal sex change, actually, so sorry, self-identified trans women, um, even without uh, a legal sex change, can um, can choose where they go in these spaces. So um, the move, the pro the proposed move to self ID, I think, can be used by bad actors. It 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 removes the kind of reassuring gatekeeping that was there. Of, you know, the psychiatric evaluations, the the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which is a highly distressing condition, and which you know, people need help with. Um, as I understand it, it, it is the sort of condition that you need medical oversight for. And 
yeah, so I think the whole, um, I, I put these two things together, the, the sort of political pressure that's being exerted on governments and on policymakers to move towards self-ID is in tandem with a desire to stop discussing uh, legal sex changes as fictions and to start treating them as somehow magically producing genuine sex changes. And in tandem with that, we're not, you know, we're increasingly finding pressure not to talk about the word female, not to talk about the word um, woman in association with female bodies, not to talk about menstruation, not to talk about any kind of process that females have that trans women don't. And I think that's harmful too, given that I'm a feminist and I think we should be able to talk about specific issues that females face as such. So yeah, all of these things are going, are closely associated, I think. Mm -hmm. I understand. But this is a bit complicated, right? Because for example, let's imagine that we have a trans woman or a trans man, even though I guess that female to male sex change is uh, rarer. But uh, I, I mean, don't you think that uh, there would be certain cases at least where a trans woman, for example, would feel insecure using the, the bathroom, for example, or the restroom of, a, of their original sex, let's say? Yeah, of course. Of course, I recognize that. What I find darkly hilarious <laughs> of course i recognize that you know and it, and presumably they would feel insecure because they're worried about getting beaten up or attacked otherwise attacked by men mm -hmm. so i find it really quite hilarious that the solution solution that immediately jumps into people's minds is i'll oh, put them in you know put them with the ladies like this is a this is a gendered assumption. Women are not here to sort out <laughs> the problems <laughs> caused by men. You know, get in other words, if this is a serious problem, resource third spaces, resource third bathrooms, you know, gender neutral bathrooms. Don't make the women's bathroom a gender neutral space, which and gender neutral just means unisex, you know. This word is a kind of buzzword, but effectively it means unisex. So let's recognize it for what it is. Um, it's, it's not up to women to sort out this social issue, especially when they would be bearing a cost. Because I have, you know, I have to stress that one, so the organization of social spaces, spaces relies on implicit, under, well understood norms about who goes where. They're not really often very, very often enforced. There's no one standing at the door of a changing room saying, you, not you, you know, you, there's no one checking your credentials. So once we loosen up and relax the norm that says, you know, changing rooms, this changing room is for women. And we usually identify women on the basis of looking like women. Once we reduce that, um, relax that norm so that people that look very like men, um, can come in, um, or at least, of course, they could come in anyway, but we, we no longer are supposed to challenge them. That's the point. Women are no longer supposed to challenge males mm -hmm. because they might be trans, they might be self-identifying. You can't tell by looking how someone identifies, and the law has been mo is moving towards self-identification as the only criterion. So the norm's getting relaxed, and that puts women at risk, basically because it, it no longer gives them a sort of min the meager protection they had in saying, sorry, you know, this is a woman only space, a potential predator can at least be kind of challenged confidently. Can't anymore, because they might be self-identifying, self so they might be in the right space after all. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and to what extent do you take seriously or do you think that it's important to make the distinction between sex and gender? Uh, I, I mean, I've already had uh, a lot of 
for example, evolutionary psychologists on the show. Uh, and I mean, I don't like that much that people or some people completely detached, mm. detach uh, psychological traits from the more physical slash biological ones as if uh, the psychological traits of men and women varied completely independently from the rest and there wasn't any biological basis to them. But in this case, and since we're also talking about fiction, uh, I mean, how do you think about gender and in what ways would it apply to these sorts of questions? So on the question of whether um, gender has any material biological basis, as in, and by, by gender I mean certain kinds of uh, behaviours, mm -hmm. mental characteristics, personality traits taken on average across a population, a sex population. Mm -hmm. So on that question, I am agnostic. Um, but I, I don't think it matters for this, for anything that I've just said, because whether or not um, females and males tend to have certain characteristics because they're hardwired or because they're environmentally produced, um, they have them. <laughs> you know, so who who knows whether male viol? I mean, I'm sure some people do know. You know, male violence is hardwired or environmentally produced. Who knows whether female alleged passivity or you know kindness or gentleness is is environmentally produced or hardwired? I mean, I I think I do know the answer to that one. Um, I don't think it's hardwired, but um, but it doesn't matter because we are produced like that on average in certain cultures anyway, and we have to deal with the culture we have. <laughs> so you know. That part of the problem with um, trans activism is that it's utopian. It's re it's ludicrously utopian. It's sort of, oh, we'll just act as if we're already. We'll or we'll we'll just make a world that we want to see by um, skipping right to the end, <laughs> you know, rather than thinking of this as a kind of process. Maybe maybe self identification in a hundred years time should be the goal and then let's incrementally first get rid of sexism, objectification, uh, tendencies to, of, of some men anyway to be violent towards women. Let's get rid of all that first and then let's talk about self-identification but let's not skip to the end. So, so in general, generally speaking, in answer to your question, I recognise that there are physical differences between the sexes now that's already a controversial thing to say in some areas, it's, you know, but I, I clearly recognize that on average, women are weaker than men physically, on average. That doesn't mean there aren't exceptions, obviously it doesn't. Sure. But physically, women are weaker than men, that's why we have separate sports. So the idea that a man, identif a male identifying as a woman can legitimately race against women is unfair. Um, given the different cat physical categories to which they belong. Then when you move into um, sort of less straightforwardly observable differences, um, sort of mental characteristics, personality traits, career choices, etc., etc., I recognise that there are differences on average. I remain agnostic about where those differences come from. Um, I think some of them are clearly environmentally produced. Some of them, at least, as, you know, depending on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, some might be exacerbated by environment. Yeah. Um, in a way, we could have compensated for them. We could have tried to to um, counteract them. Uh, but none of this is that relevant to who gets to count as a woman or a man, because um, the word gender is just used in multiply confusing ways. And I would want to use the word gender to stick to this stuff, you know, the, the, the behavioral characteristics, the physical differences that are, might be sort of socially produced in some way. Not, no, sorry, not physical differences socially produced, but behavioral characteristics mm -hmm. um, socially produced. Whereas there's a whole other tendency within philosophy to talk about gender as whether you're a woman or not. And those are not the same thing.
for me. Sorry, I hope that made sense. I got a bit, got a bit confused. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit complicated, but uh, I mean, let me just ask you this, I guess. Uh, so earlier you were referring to the importance of in the law and so on, uh, dealing with women uh, as different from men in, for example, the case of reproduction. So uh, I guess that uh, when you were talking about, uh, so let's imagine that all of the psychological differences that we see on average occurring between men and women were all culturally produced. Even then, because we have clear physical differences, like uh, on the level of uh, re uh, the reproductive system and, and things like that. I mean, it, it, it seems to be pretty obvious that uh, those cultural, uh, cultural things that people would create would stem exactly from the fact that it doesn't make sense for people to deal with and interact with people uh, that at least reproduce differently uh, in society. Because, I, I, I mean, you have this thing about how people establish, for example, romantic and sexual relationships, and of course, uh, men and women reproduce differently, and so, I mean, it makes sense to me that uh, you would never have a society where people would look at and deal with and interact with men and women exactly in the same way. Um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about heterosexual people, but um, yeah, sure. most people are heterosexual. So... Yes, I agree with you. I don't, I can't, I mean, we are social and, and so being social involves stereotypes. They're kind of quick heuristic devices for predicting um, things that are important practically in getting around the world and having, knowing who to have sex with and is one of them. So um, it, it seems to me you're right that given reproduction is essential to the species, and given at the moment it takes place, you know, naturally for most people, uh, thank God, <laughs> I don't think we want a world where we're all, you know, produced in test tubes, um, then there's going to be social differences between males and females. They don't have to be the social differences we have now, though. I mean, there's, there's a big leap from saying, yes, there are going to be social differences that allow us to um, differentiate uh, between two sets of people easily and also perform many other functions too. Mm -hmm. And saying that the ones we have now are the ones to have. I mean, I don't think that follows. So I think we can still criticize quite strongly some aspects of, the, of Western social stereotypes about females and males and say that they don't have to be like that, and we can point to other societies where they aren't like that, so that shows that they're not inevitable. Mm -hmm. But then there's also another big problem here, right? That is, when people talk about, for example, uh, raising boys for them to be a little bit more feminine or something like that, or the opposite, uh, I mean, isn't it the case that uh, the idea that we can completely manipulate the traits of people because they are completely socio-culturally constructed, uh, wouldn't that be a bit uh, oppressive in the sense that, okay, so now a bunch of people would gather and would decide what kind of utopia they would want and then they would enforce on boys and girls the kinds of traits that they would consider to be ideal or something like that. So, I mean, isn't that problematic as well? Well, yeah, but I'm not suggesting we do that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Have you tried to raise children? Because I have. <laughs> and what you realize quite quickly is you, your influence is pretty limited or at least that's what I realized quite quickly. My influence was pretty limited anyway in a range of things, not just about gender traits, but about, you know, personality traits. They they come out 
like with a point of view, uh, which emerges pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, I think the idea that we can um, <laughs> that we could manipulate every possible um, variable in a child is hubristic and overconfident. Um, I think that's consistent with recognizing that in a given society there are what you know I consider to be damaging tendencies in the way that girls and boys are respectively um, represented in the media, represented throughout culture, thought of um, by others, um, and you can work against those, I think, reasonably well. So um, most, I don't think, you know, I don't know what it's like in Portugal, but I think teenage girls here are having a very t hard time on average at the moment. Um, when I look around and see teenage girls, I see with obvious exceptions and I'm generalizing, but I see very highly self-conscious, um, physically awkward, <laughs> uh, frightened people <laughs> who don't like their bodies very much and who don't move through the world with the kind of confidence that they could move with. You know, it's not about, that's not about being a boy or a girl because it's about being oppressed by the idea of what other people think of them. It's about the way social media tends to perpetrate, perpetrate, or perpetuate certain kinds of stereotypes about female bodies. That's all stuff that parents should, I think, fight against. But that, you know, that's entirely contingent. It could, could be a completely different way in a different society. So it seems to me that this discussion, this debate that you're describing here, it gets polarized. It gets polarized into um, everything's malleable, everything's social cultural, sociocultural, and nothing is. And clearly, there's a going to be somewhere in the middle, and and that's where we should be going for and trying to feel it out and look at evidence where it's available, but also just think think about what looks like a healthy human being. And I don't think um, a child, a, a teenage girl, resorting to plastic surgery is a healthy human being on average if they're doing it for cosmetic reasons because they hate the way they look. I think that's not healthy and that is socially produced, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, so earlier in the interview, at a certain point, you referred to the fact that you are a bit skeptical of, um, for example, children uh, transitioning uh, or changing sex. I, I mean, we've already talked about how the expression changing sex is a bit problematic, but uh, I, I mean, perhaps as a, last, as a last topic in the interview, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, yes. Uh, <laughs> what can I say about that? I can say um, I recognize that children and adults, uh, sorry, children and young adults can have gender dysphoria. I mean, there are many ways to dislike one's body. There are many ways to, especially as one develops, to feel at odds with what's expected, what one thinks what is expected of one. And there is a rapid rise, um, or there's a there is there's been a significant rise um, recently in teenage girls identifying as boys, feeling gender dysphoria identifying as boys or identifying as non-binary. Now, that's to me, it looks like a completely different phenomenon to a 50-year-old male transitioning, suddenly, you know, married with children transitioning. Um, I think academically, psychologically, sociologically, that looks like a different sort of thing. So what I find disturbing is um, that trans activist organizations and LGBT advocacy organizations shove those two things together and treat them like they're one. They treat it like a matter of justice that children and teenagers should have access to medicine that will um, either delay their puberty or, you know, they will go on to what's called cross-sex hormones. Um, children and teenagers, are their brains are still developing. 
they their understanding of themselves is still developing it turns out that many of these children are will turn would have turned out to be gay or are pre-gay or are gay depending on how you want to put it you know they are attract same sex attracted quite often they are gender non-conforming in the sense that they have bodies that don't quite fit with the the social stereotypes of what a classic female or classic male should look like and it's just too soon like way too soon for them to be making permanent decision life-altering decisions about who they are and altering their bodies accordingly either by breast binding or by um because breast binding has effect you no know, physical effects on people um or by taking drugs so i find it one of the most shocking morally despicable <laughs> aspects of trans activism is the casual disregard they seem to have for these issues it just seems to me that children and teenagers who are suffering from gender dysphoria are being used by adults um as some kind of collateral emotive hook um to further their own ends and you know we could easily have told a different story there trans activists could have easily told a different story they could have said yes fully adult people should have access to surgery fully adult people who oh, sorry <laughs> the cat <laughs> <laughs> she's attacking me um should yeah they could have easily just drawn a line which said okay we're going to advocate for adults but we're going to leave the care of children up to professionals but instead they've got right in there politically they have disrupted um medics relationships to their patients they have sought to influence parents um relationships with medics in in britain anyway there are these organizations that have really got far too closely involved with the medical care of children who are vulnerable very vulnerable anyway and it's just not right it's just not right so i'm really outraged about that and i would just urge activists trans activists to stop talking about children because it's not their business that it's not their expertise it's not a matter of justice they should stop projecting back because what they do is they say oh but when i was a child i would have loved to have had that surgery well fine but <laughs> that's not there are plenty of other children who will be having in america surgery or in britain taking taking drugs who will come to regret it you know and 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 then their bodies will be permanently altered they may be infertile that's a massive massive um problem for them later potentially mm -hmm. so the biggest issue here is not really that um i mean children could transition or use for example hormone blockers pu puberty blockers but uh, it would have to be done in a proper medical context. They would have to be followed by medical professionals because, I, I mean, there is also that, argu that argument that, uh, I mean, we know that there are children that and adolescents and etc. that suffer from gender dysphoria and, I mean, it can produce, I, I never went through that, but I imagine that it can very easily produce lots of mental suffering so uh, i mean because on the other hand th this is also a bit of a of an empirical question right uh, people have to study what are the proper ages where children are already well aware of their uh, of the gender they identify with and if those sorts of procedures are uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, are good or not? To, to well, I mean, I agree. It's an it's a question that we need evidence. We need to bring evidence in. I absolutely agree with that. And I'm I'm not the sort of person that says usually anyway. I'm not the person that says never. Um, so I'm willing to concede. I suppose that. Well, I think I'm not sure what I think, but I suppose. But just for the sake of argument, let me concede that very occasionally there might be there might be a child who is so dysphoric, self-harming, set in their mind, 
that, you know, it turns out that medically transitioning them or at least delaying puberty was the right decision for them. And that, but that's not something we could tell while they're a child. We'll have to wait to the, much later on in their life to know that for sure. You know, it's going to, they're a hostage to fortune. That's part of the problem that we can't tell how these children are going to think about it in future. And we shouldn't be assuming that they will think um, in a particular way. But the other thing to say is that this phenomenon is not new. I mean, I, I'm gay and I have lots of lesbian friends and many of them, I am telling you, went through prolonged periods in their childhood where they wanted to be called boys' names. They dressed as boys. Some of them used to pee standing up. You know, they, they had a very strong desire to be a boy. And looking back, they now understand that desire because they were same-sex attracted. They were often very tomboy and sporty and they hung around with boys and they didn't feel identified with girls. Um, and, and they see that feeling as a result of confusion. Um, now, there's no reason to think that's not still going on. In fact, there's every reason to think it is still going on. Because if anything, the sort of social stereotypes of females and males in youth culture have got much more polarized. So, you know, just think about like, music videos that girls are watching the average pop star is so you know high heels tons of makeup fillers cosmetic cosmetic fillers all over their faces you know you might well look as that look look at someone like that as a as a child who's a tomboy and think i'm not like that <laughs> i must be a boy <laughs> you know so you need time to work that stuff out and you need therapy you need therapy that is not being politically interfered with by organisations who have a vested interest in you drawing a certain conclusion. And that's not what's happening in Britain at the moment. So we need to protect the therapeutic process and allow people plenty of space over years to talk through these feelings. And um, I just don't, I'm worried that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So, just before we go, are there any other relevant topic regarding transgenderism and gender and these topics that we've been exploring that you would like to talk a little bit more about or not? Um, I think we've covered quite a lot of it. I'm sure there is. I mean, I think the important thing I want to keep stressing is that... Um, although I'm often depicted as an extremist um, by my critics, because of course it's politically advantageous to depict me as an extremist, I actually wouldn't revoke the possibility of illegal sex change. You know, I w in, the, in the UK, I wouldn't, if I was God, revoke the Gender Recognition Act. So that puts me at odds with a lot of radical feminists who would. Um, I think we are where we are. I don't, I, you know, if we could go back in time, I think we shouldn't have had a Gender Recognition Act. I think we should have just tried to work for a society that allowed there to be exceptionally of feminine men and masculine women unproblematically and without any discrimination. But um, we are where we are. We've got one now. And there are transsexuals who have been living their lives as the other sex for years. And I don't, I just don't think pragmatically it's useful to, to think about reconstructing the law in that way. However, Obviously, I'm against self-ID. I think that's the move for me. That's the, the line in the sand. So I just want to be clear that for anyone that's interested, that my view is not as extreme as, as it's sometimes taken to be. And I'm also very happy, as I say, individually, I'm very happy to use preferred pronouns, to use whatever name someone wants, you know, in... Um, in private relationships with people. What I'm against is the state um, saying, Imposing. saying I have to, because not just because that's illiberal, but because that then very quickly degenerates into a, a situation where we have now, where people believe that people can change sex. They don't know why they believe it. They don't have any evidence for it. They don't have any arguments for it, but nonetheless, they're sure it must be true. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let's end on that note. And before we go, would you like to tell people what would be some of the best places on the internet for them to find your work? Well, I have a website um, which covers all the stuff that we've just been talking about, kathleenstock.com. So, but if you want to, if you're interested in my stuff on fiction, you can get my book, which has just come out in paper, paperback with uh, Oxford University Press, and it's called Only Imagine Fiction, Interpretation and Imagination. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview, both on the video interview and the podcast one, the podcast version. So, Dr. Stock, thank you again a lot for taking the time to come on the show, and it was a real pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thanks for having me. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just $1, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. You can also support me on PayPal or Subscribestar. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, and also my three producers, Isar Weber, Rosie and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.